So I have a little tradition when it comes to Pride Month that I like to look back at the year and think about all the things that have happened in my life and think about all the things that have been going on in the world, both good and bad, and to really reflect on them and to sit with them and to consider what all of this means for LGBT people. And usually this ends up being kind of a bummer. It's, it's not, and it's not that I don't like the party atmosphere. I like going downtown and walking through the parade streets and going to the bars and you know, listening to older gay people complain publicly about their spouse. I, I like that and last year I really missed it. It's just that if we have one month to talk about LGBT issues and really focus in, I think that we should both talk about, sure, the block party stuff, but we should also talk about the reasons why the celebration is necessary. You know, because we're not just celebrating because queer people are minority, we're celebrating because queer lives are difficult in some really specific ways. And if you just focus in on the block party aspects and you don't look at the stories and the statistics, you're kind of missing the point. And I get it that this kind of reflection can be sometimes a bit of a downer, a bit of a bummer, but I think that it's important to do. But this year I'm going to be breaking with tradition. Not because I don't want to be a bummer, but because this kind of storytelling never seems to work. They never do what I hope they're gonna do. You know, usually you'll get a very emotional, very sympathetic response. Well, of course you know we love and support you. Who are you? I'm the gremlin. Who let you in? You let me in. Why are you here? Because this is gonna be a fun one. Oh boy. About eight years ago now, I started trying to explain to people in my life who mattered to me what being gay meant to me. I wanted to be able to communicate the fear, sadness, and the loneliness about being a lesbian. And although I felt like a condemned woman, I could never get my friends to understand. Words weren't enough. At least my words weren't enough, but I continued to try and explain until their patience were thin. I'd be happy to listen if you had anything new to say. But how could we move on to the more advanced issues when they couldn't even seem to wrap their heads around the basics? Back then, I wanted my friends to understand. I wanted people to understand where I was coming from. I wanted to feel heard. I wanted to feel seen by them. And since then, I've realized that that's impossible. Um, and that's okay. Um, you know, I've got a lot of queer friends now who do understand where I'm coming from. And I ask, I think, I hope, I ask a lot less of my friends who can't provide that. And so that's not my goal anymore. I've had a new goal for several years now. These days, I tell my queer stories in order that people understand why a fight for equality, both politically and societally, is still necessary. I would tell some very specific targeted stories to try and sort of show, like, oh, here's some tidbits about queer life that maybe you wouldn't know if you know, you haven't lived that life yourself, to sort of uh, sprinkle in, you know, some more understanding, not to hopefully have someone, you know, understand what it is to be gay the way, you know, I used to think was possible, but um, rather to have people realize, oh, so maybe political action is still needed. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, I think that the stories ended up being similar enough to the old ones, or maybe I just hadn't communicated my new purpose particularly well because I get the same response. I'm sorry things are so hard for you. And that's not what I wanted. So clearly I need to do something different. I'm going to communicate the need for political action over the need for sympathy, literally reels over feels. That's what I'm gonna do. And since people have said they'll listen if I have some new information for them, I'm going to put this whole thing through the lens of something that I've been researching lately, internalized homophobia. 
This is an idea that I've heard tossed around since well before I came out and sometimes accurately, sometimes with a weird agenda attached. And it turns out that this is actually a fairly nuanced and even confusing topic. In fact, the reason why I started looking into this topic in the first place and started writing this video is because of a story that a friend of mine told me who works in a corporate business type workplace. This friend works for a very large business and my understanding is that there is some kind of affinity council for LGBT people with which they're involved and they're trying to bring members of their team to try and get them to engage in this LGBT social. And one of the team members, uh, maybe more than one of the team members, said, Why do you care so much? Are you gay? Which it puts them in an awkward situation. But they said, you know, maybe it's just internalized homophobia that I'm not out to my colleagues. Maybe it's a me problem. To which I said, no, it is absolutely not a you problem. Because there are some things that are internalized homophobia, and there are some things that are actually just a rational response to being in a toxic or conservative environment where you don't think that you would be uh, accepted, safe, productive, a good integrated team member, etc. So if you are, for example, a teenager with conservative parents and you think that you would get kicked out of your house because you're gay, that's not internalized homophobia to not come out to your parents. And that's a pretty big example. There are certainly a lot of cases that are, you know, smaller scale, but also you want to avoid. Like if you have a lot of, I don't know, teammates who are all saying some low-grade homophobic stuff around you. It's not like a hate crime, it's not a slur, but you just wonder if you came out, if they, if they knew, would they turn that ire on you, you know? You're not wanting to find out isn't internalized homophobia. That is, that is like a safety mechanism. So that's what internalized homophobia isn't. What internalized homophobia is, is the deep-seated acceptance of all those terrible things that people say about gay people. And you can apply this to yourself, to your partner, to your loved ones, to your broader community, but the essence of it is that you are gay and you've bitten the bullet. You just believe all the horrible things that have been said about you. And as a case study, I'm going to tell you a little story about a date that I went on back when I was in college. Now, I mentioned on this channel before that I went to a conservative school in a very small town. For a while there, it felt like every time I met a new gay person, like they were my last chance at marriage and happiness. And I, I don't know, when you live in a small town, you just, even if you don't plan to stay, it, it, it gets into your head a little bit. So I was on a date with this woman who was a little bit older than me. She, she didn't go to the school or anything. We were at this restaurant and she broke the news that she was already married. Um, now the way that she said it, I seem to recall she liked the social capital that came with dating a man, made me realize that I didn't have the kind of social capital that she was looking for, you know? And it made me think that maybe I didn't have the kind of social capital that any woman looking for and that I wasn't enough you know men were enough because a man and a woman that's a whole marriage a woman and a woman what's that supposed to be what I find interesting about this story is that we both have internalized homophobia it just manifests in different ways her internalized homophobia manifests in her just marrying a guy and before anybody could accuse me of being biphobic nope she told me she was a lesbian and that the only reason that she was married to this guy was for the social capital uh, which there's a word for that compat short for compulsory heterosexuality now on my side of things this was the last time i ever saw her but it did start to enter my mind every once in a while that maybe I wasn't enough. Like, I would never be able to provide the social capital that another woman would want 
from me and that I just never be enough. And you see this in the broader community too. People who have internalized homophobia are less likely to have queer friends, they're less likely to have queer support systems, less likely to even recognize their own needs. If, for example, they go to see a therapist, they might not look for an affirming therapist. They might not look for people who can support them. And these are all really important things. So it's a really complicated set of feelings, and it can manifest itself in so many different ways. It can even manifest in one talking badly about oneself or one's community in a really misguided and harmful way. Which brings me to the second thing that internalized homophobia isn't, and that is regular homophobes. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to separate homophobes into two basic categories. You've got the one-to-one -one homophobes who will uh, say slurs at you, fire you, harass you, etc. One-to-one. On the other side, you've got these political homophobes who might be very nice to you, but they'll vote away your rights. Something I would hear a lot from adults whenever a homophobe came up, either an interpersonal homophobe or a uh, political homophobe, what they would say was some variation of, oh, he's just saying that because he's gay and hates himself. Which, I get why they say this. I get that they're trying to say the most insulting thing that this person would find the most insulting. You know, if they hate gay people, then it's the most insulting targeted insult to say they're gay. But the thing is about this is that who cares? You know, I don't care if this horrible person um, has a tortured backstory because they're still making life harder for the rest of us. You know, like it actually doesn't matter if you are a gay person if you're making life harder for other gays. Like, you are still doing the homophobia. You are still making life for gay people worse. And I don't have any patience or sympathy for that. So, let's talk praxis. So, obviously, bigotry hurts people. It sucks to hear. It can lead to internalized homophobia, but it also means that you need allies. And how do you get allies on your side? Well, you communicate with them. You say, I need help, and this is why. So, like I mentioned earlier, there is a limit to human empathy. You know, people can only understand so far. So my trying as a teenager, as an early 20s, trying to get my friends to understand what my life was, what I was going through, it's, it's not productive. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I used to try very hard to tap into just the, the, the empathy center of my friends and to try and get them to understand. You know, I would, I would communicate as best as I could, it would never work out, and I made myself kind of unlikable in the process. And when I figured out that people really didn't like hearing about what was going on with me, I dialed it way back. You know, not to like zero percent or anything, but you know, if you don't want to hear about it, you don't have to hear about it. Let's just hang out. But around the same time that I started to mellow out or, you know, at least stop looking for empathy where I wasn't gonna find it, I started to notice that the world around me was changing, like really, really fast. I feel like in high school there was still this big question about whether or not gay was even something you could talk about. You know, the idea that there were people on YouTube talking about gayness 10 years ago, I thought that, like, why would you ever admit to this publicly? You'll get fired. You'll never get a new job. They'll look you up and they'll see that you're gay and they'll, you'll, like, you're gonna be homeless. Like, that's literally what I thought. You know, and I think part of this is the fact that I, I saw just a lot of statistics about, um, you know, youth homelessness among LGBT people, and I think that at one point it was like 25% of LGBT teens were homeless. Like, that's how high it was back then. And that's just not the case anymore. I mean, there are still 
it's still a big issue, but I'm here on YouTube talking about being gay and I'm not even worried that I, I won't get a job. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a teacher and I'm not even worried about whether or not I'll be able to get a job because it's just not the same kind of big bad that it was 10 years ago. But at the same time, there are so many experiences that I have that are more recent that just don't jive with the idea that homophobia is over, actually. And sometimes it feels like gaslighting that people try and tell me that it's all over when it's not, you know? There are things, very big, very tangible, very personal things, political things that I see all around me, even in an amazing liberal city like DC. 2016, obviously there was the Pulse nightclub shooting and and in 2019, somebody brought a gun to Pride um, in, in DuPont Circle, and I wasn't there at the time. Um, I have heard from people who were that it was just a stampede of people through the streets. Um, you were running or you were being trampled, basically, and everybody thought that there was going to be a shooting, and nobody ended up getting shot, but you just... The only reason why you bring a gun to Pride is to scare people and, and to threaten people. You want people to feel unsafe and you want them to feel like they can't meet in public. And later that same year, I had a therapist who was supposedly LGBT affirming. I don't go to therapists who aren't because, hi, um, who said to me, don't you think your girlfriend is more like just a friend anyway? Yeah. And until 2020, it was perfectly legal to fire someone for being gay. And even in places where it was explicitly illegal to fire someone for being gay, there's still a loophole. I mean, there's a saying in the gay community, married on Sunday, fired on Monday, because while they can't fire you for being gay, they can fire you for getting gay married. And it's a subtle distinction, but it's the legal loophole that a lot of companies use to get away with not having any of those gay employees. And then there are just the daily little things like going onto a dating app and like half the people that you think you're gonna meet, turns out she's actually a couple and she's actually straight in the couple and this is all her boyfriend's idea, actually. And um, no, I'm not interested in a three-way, thanks. Did you read, did you read my, what I don't get here is that it seems to always be the guy's idea to do this three-way. So I wonder why they look for lesbians instead of straight girls. Like if they're looking, if he's looking for another girl, he should look for a girl who wants him. And I don't understand. And one possible explanation, I don't know if this is the truth, they have got more respect for straight women, and they see straight women as monogamous marriage material, whereas lesbians are just... <laughs> and last but not least is the fact that I seem to attract a very specific kind of guy who wants to be friends, wants to be best friends with me, but then he starts to flirt with me and I'll say, oh no, I'm actually a lesbian. And he'll say, oh, and then he'll keep flirting with me. And I've already said, no, I'm a lesbian. And he knows that any more rejection can't really hurt him because I'm not really rejecting him, am I? I'm rejecting masculinity, so it's a very safe thing in that way to flirt with me. It's very safe, it's very unthreatening if I reject him, and I just keep flirting. And I, I, I've had this happen four times. I keep losing best friends to this, and it's frustrating.
And these experiences I, I bring up because they're incompatible with the idea that homophobia is over actually. When I bring up these anecdotes about being LGBT, I often get the response, well, of course you know we love and support you, which is very nice, but it doesn't change the fact that heterosexism isn't a one-to-one, -one, and that's not why I'm making this. When I was younger, I would bring up these stories to try and get people to understand, and that's not what I'm doing anymore. And I'm also not doing this so that people will tell me that they love me, because I I mean, I, I trust that you do, and you loving me, I mean, no offense, but you telling me that you love me doesn't make all these problems go away. These problems go away with action. They go away with constant personal and political action, and I've gotten a whole lot better in the last couple of years about speaking up when something doesn't sound, look, feel right to me. And I have always voted in, in my own best interest. I wonder though, if everybody who tells me that they love me votes like they love me. I don't know if they vote thinking, yeah, I, I do think that Chloe should be able to marry and have a job, actually. I, I think that she'd be a good mother. I bet most gay people would be a good mother. Let me vote for the candidate who supports that, you know? I don't know if they do. And the thing is, to them, my rights are an abstraction, you know? My rights as a citizen, my rights as a wife, my rights as an employee, that's why I tell my stories. And we've seen this again and again in LGBT political organizing. If you tell your story and you make yourself human, then people will respond with votes. And so I continue to tell my story. And I, I just need to underline it with that, that don't tell me you love me, vote like you love me community organize like you love me. If you're going to give money to charity, make sure that that charity isn't anti-LGBT. Looking at you, Salvation Army. And if you love the Salvation Army, I'm sure that wherever you live, there is a local charity that does the exact same thing and doesn't have the same kind of baggage. I'm telling my story because I need allies. I'm telling my stories because I need you to understand that I still need your help. And I'm telling my story because it's the most tried and true method within the LGBT community and in how we've politically organized and gotten our rights. And if it's worked before, it'll work again. And it's important. And while there tends to be a disconnect, at least on a day-to-day -day basis, between one-to-one -one homophobia and political homophobia, we live in a democracy, which means that the things people think and feel tend to have a bearing on our politics. On one hand, I want my rights. And on the other hand, communication has also proven to lead to a more tolerant society. But it's also the case that I have to live with these people.